Uh, tonight our topic is um, Our Lady and the Victory Over Evil. And I want to focus on uh, two, in particular, two theological dimensions of her victory over evil and her help that she provides to us in our victory over evil. Uh, the first uh, I want to talk about, the first reality is simply holiness in itself. You know, what does it mean to be holy? And then more particularly, how is this reality of holiness and freedom from evil related to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? The second reality that I would talk about tonight is uh, simply uh, the reality of death. What does it mean to die? And how does that reality of death, related as it is to the mystery of evil, tie into Our Lady giving birth in Bethlehem? And the answer to that question will only be made clear when we uh, consider another birth that Our Lady uh, uh, underwent, which was the birth of all her children on Mount Calvary. These three mysteries are uh, what I would speak to you tonight about. We start with the mystery of holiness and its relationship to the Immaculate Conception. The first victory, anticipatory victory, we might say, given to Our Lady, is given to Our Lady when she was privileged to be conceived without original sin. Now, we should not overstate the difference between her conception and our own. For example, uh, the fact that she was immaculately conceived did not mean that she was born with the preternatural privileges that belonged to Adam and Eve uh, in their pre-lapsarian state. Uh, she was not born immune from death, and she was not born immune from pain. She had none of the preternatural gifts that uh, graced Adam and Eve before the fall. Mary, in fact, was born into mortality and therefore born into pain just as we all of us are born into mortality and pain. But we shouldn't understate the difference between her conception and ours either. We might be tempted to do that. Uh, we might, for example, be tempted to see in Mary's conception, free from original sin, uh, simply an early start into our own baptized condition. So Mary was conceived free from the stain of original sin? Good. Well, we're not conceived free of the stain of original sin, but then we are baptized. And then, and thus, are we made free from original sin. From the moment of our baptism, we and Mary share a graced condition. She was born into the friendship of God, while we come into friendship with God a few days after our birth at baptism. Now, is that really the difference between Mary's condition and our own, a few days? That doesn't seem probable. In fact, that seems ridiculous. Uh, we might say, state the difference between her conception and our own in this way. In her conception, Mary is radically holy in all of the dimensions of her person. Now, we all of us have a long way to go before that's true of us. Let's look at what the word holy means. Holy means separate and unique. It means being radically different. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And if we were to translate that into English, one way to do it might be to sing different, unspeakably different, ineffably different, and uncommon with the world is the Lord of hosts. Now, if that's your idea, 
then you can easily see how uh, the, the Jewish people could get the idea that holiness means withdrawal from common use. Time is holy because it belongs exclusively to God. Space in a synagogue or church is uh, holy because it's exclusively devoted to God. Utensils too, buildings, persons, chalices, vestments, all of these things are withdrawn from common use. This is what's really wrong with the idea of having a, uh, you know, a common cup serve as a chalice. It, uh, it forgets the idea that you're dealing with something radically holy, you see. So time, space, utensils, buildings, persons who are withdrawn from common circulation and devoted to the separate and transcendent God are deemed to be holy. Now notice that this notion of holiness is not yet moral. It's not a properly moral idea. The notion of holiness is common to all religions, but the tying of holiness to moral forms of goodness, to specifically moral forms of goodness, is Israel's unique achievement. How is this connection made? It's made by the addition of the essential notion of oneness. Listen to the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. What, a, what does that mean? Oneness here has definite links with the notion of separation of which we have just sp spoken. One means unique. So here the prayer exhorts Israel to relate to the Lord as though he were the only God who existed. Treat God as the only God. See? But notice that oneness doesn't only mean uniqueness, it means undividedness as well. The saying is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now what this rules out is the double-mindedness that is spoken of in Psalm 12, where the psalm says, falsehood they speak to another with lying lips and a double heart. This being undivided in the self, this undividedness of being, is in fact a condition for approaching the temple for worship. If you look at Psalm 24, which is an entrance song into the sanctuary of the temple of Jerusalem, Psalm 24 asks, Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Drawing near in worship is allowed to the single-hearted. And on the other hand, cultic worship, which conceals fraud, is especially hateful to the Lord because cultic worship especially signifies the condition of being of one heart and one mind. But we're not like that. The human heart is treacherous, says Jeremiah, and who can understand it? The human heart is irreparably double-minded and can only be rendered single again as an act of creation, a new creation, in fact. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart. Notice the word create. It's almost as though we're talking about something ex nihilo. My heart is a mess, but you can make it clean and undivided. Jesus says that it is from this divided heart that all evil flows, not from violations of external prohibitions. He doesn't offer a solution for this for us, except that it is his whole mission through his death and resurrection to make such wholeness available again. Now, the point with Mary is this. His mother, Jesus' mother, the church believes, 
received such wholeness and singleness of heart from her birth and in anticipation of what her son would win for us all. Well, the origin of our double-mindedness is, of course, traced to the fall, original sin. Look at Genesis 3 tonight, um, when you have a chance. It's the account of the temptation of Adam and Eve and their fall. Notice the serpent's line of attack. What he invites Eve to do is to doubt the goodness of God. And doubting the goodness of God here means believing that God has his own agenda, which is not necessarily ordered to the good of human beings. God, in fact, has a needy love for the human rather than a purely self-giving love for the human being. See, that's the idea. Uh, God, if you want to put it this way, wants to establish a codependent relationship. Uh, anyway, that's the idea that the devil sells. This is a nurtured doubt in Eve and then Adam. This is a welcome to mistrust. And it's accompanied by a demand for autonomy, which the serpent offers. You shall be as gods, he says, knowing good and evil. That is to say, determining for yourselves what is good and evil. This radical demand for autonomy is always born of suspicion. And it is one of the chief and enduring effects of the fall on all the descendants of Adam. The effect of this is to freeze man's mind in suspicion and mistrust. And for that reason, the human person is forbidden to make images of God. Why? Well, um, partly to avoid magic, partly to avoid compromising the sovereignty of God who will appear where he will and when he will, but also because any image of God that we would make in our present mental condition would only represent our fear, hatred, and mistrust of God. Adam says, I heard you and I hid because I was afraid. From this point on, when we make representations of God, they will represent our own reflection of our own fear and mistrust of ourselves and of our God. The idea is that man is guilty and therefore God is vengeance-seeking. And since man is made to the image of God, if man is vengeance-seeking and twisted, so God becomes monstrous. The image of God in man is distorted and so man's sense of man as well as his sense of God becomes warped. This lack of union with God this loss of this primordial relationship of trust in God is reflected in man's inner divisions. St. Augustine referred to this as the loss of original justice. In original justice, the mind was obedient to God and the passions of man were obedient to the mind of man. With the fall, men and women have been born into a condition of rebellion, and the mind is frozen in mistrust of God and no longer knows him. The passions are subsequently in a state of disobedience to the mind. The good that I would do, that I, that I do not do, says Paul in St. Paul in Romans chapter 7. This is what is known as the fomes peccati, the affective inflammation of sin. Uh, put more colloquially, the buttons that others can push in us are points of vulnerability. Uh, Augustine called them the kindlings of sin, little shaving pieces of wood that are ever ready to burst into flame. See, uh, this, These effective inflammations of sin in our soul, this remains after baptism. It was not removed by baptism, but it not only was this uh, not present subsequently in Mary, it was never present in Mary. This, the, foam is, uh, uh, the, the seeds of inflammation, the, inf the effective inflammation of sin is never, was never present in her, and that is why she is from the beginning of a peace. You know, she has no need for self-deception. 
And it's this inner unity, this oneness, that protects her from the possibility of sin. Because, you know, sin depends to some degree on self-deception and inner division and incoherence. Sin presupposes not being of a piece. Sin presupposes being in pieces. And it causes going to pieces. The extreme form of this, of course, uh, the extreme form of not being of a piece is demonic possession. What is your name? Jesus asked the demon. It is legion, he said, for we are many. There are many examples of this. Uh, you could look at the doctors, the Nazi doctors in the concentration camps who considered themselves still, even as they were doing medical experiments on human beings, they didn't consider themselves torturers. They considered themselves doctors. Why? Because they were healing a race. You've got to be pretty far removed from ordinary forms of reason or sanity to be able to believe that, and yet they did. Um, they so separated the evil from the rest of their lives, and they spent much of their time not at the concentration camp, cultivating good music, love of children, sunsets, sentimental relationships with their pets, lovely people. What happened at work happened at another world, see? What is your name? Legion. We are many. Very scary stuff. Now Mary is not like this. In her, because of this surpassing grace, there is a primordial trust in the truthfulness of God, which was there from the beginning of her conception. And this makes it possible for her to make an unqualified yes to God's offer of salvation. She says it without reserve. Fiat. Oh, let it be. That's the optative mood, which is not just a, yeah, okay, kind of, uh, you wouldn't translate it by saying, ah, okay. You'd translate it by saying, oh, yes, 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 yes. You see, it's much more enthusiastic and, wo and willing than that, right? Uh, she makes an unqualified yes to God from the bottom of her soul. This means that she is entitled to worship at the temple. In fact, so total is her integrity that she becomes an archetype of the temple and is called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, she sees herself as she is and has no need of self-deception, and she sees us, all of us, as we are, and she still has no need of self-deception. She doesn't look at me and say, oh, there's my son, what a great doctor of the church he'll one day be. No, sorry, not going to happen, not like that. Look at my, that wonderful person over there who's got, no, they, she doesn't kid herself, she's not delusional, she loves us because she sees what's really there. And what's really there is the goodness that God has really put into us and that will yet one day come to flower because God's grace is triumphant. She sees that and loves us without any self-deception. Mothers sometimes kid themselves when it comes to their kids, but not her. She sees all the way through without sentimentality and with perfect hope. She sees us as we are and loves us as we are because she sees our destiny and knows what it is we are called to. Mary is sometimes the victim of bad art uh, because the holiness or integrity which is at the roots of her being is not easy to picture. It's simple, it's simplicity itself, but it's not simple-mindedness. Her simplicity is not a psychological profile. It is a theological grace. And it can exist, coexist with many temperaments. Aristotle said it was hard to imagine the perfectly happy man. Well, try imagining someone radically of a piece in grace. God is purely intelligible in himself, but not to our minds. And Mary is simple with a simplicity analogous to God's, and we simply don't know what to do with that. She loves us in a very mysterious way. 
But the Immaculate Conception, you see, allows her to see without distortion, and it makes it impossible for her to hide from love. That's why she can see and face everything. Now, this is a grace given in advance of the event of the cross and resurrection, but it's still caused by the cross and resurrection. It was an anticipation of the merits of Jesus Christ that she was given this privilege. Dominicans historically had great difficulty with the idea of a, the Immaculate Conception. Aquinas himself didn't accept it because it seemed to imply that Mary was not in re need of redemption. How could this be? Well, it's the glory of Duns Scotus to see that it is in fact a greater mercy to never have gone wrong than to be righted after first having gone wrong. She is the archetype of humanity as God intended it to be, and she is a prophecy of what one day we will all be. So she shows us in her own person the restored image of God. She is our mother. She is the Ark of the Covenant. She is the dwelling place of God. She is radically of a peace. She is radically holy. And this is why she can communicate this grace, uh, or an analogous grace, to us. The Immaculate Conception made possible and fitting the Virgin's acceptance of God's offer. She had no mistrust. She was open to God's word to a degree not possible for sons and daughters of Adam. She indeed conceived the word in her body because she first conceived him in her heart. And this offer culminates in Bethlehem with the birth of Christ. The birth is virginal and has the significance of total self-giving and total fruitfulness. A total surrender to God, the church teaches, from a position of emptiness can herald the new creation. The church teaches that Mary remained a virgin before, during, and after the act of giving birth. For our purposes, the troublesome part is the middle one, which is Mary's virginity in giving birth to Christ. And we remember that one of the sufferings inherited because of original sin is that of a child bearing pains. Uh, the Lord said to Eve uh, in 3.16, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Now, since Mary was free from original sin by her immaculate conception, she would consequently be free of pain in bearing a child. And this seemed to entail a miraculous birth. Pope Leo the Great said, She brought him forth without loss of virginity, even as she conceived him without its loss. The fathers compared the birth of the Lord to him miraculously appearing from the tomb or behind the locked door. Some fathers used the analogy of the birth of our Lord to a ray of sun shining through a glass. As the glass is unaltered by the ray, so was Mary by the birth of our Lord. Medieval theologians seem to have universally agreed that the Virgin did not suffer labor pains at the miraculous birth of Christ. As the new Eve, who redeems us from the sins of the first woman, Mary is exempt from the curse that condemned Eve to bear children in great pain. Correspondingly, nativity scenes don't show extreme physical distress. Mary's never portrayed in, as a suffering agony in her birth of the Savior. But, and this is important, uh, Mary becomes a mother again a second time, this time on Calvary. My own uh, idea is this. Uh, if I were to put it in a sentence, on Calvary, Mary died in childbirth. 
Uh, to make this clear, I need to talk about death in general and then the death of Jesus. Then, having done this, I can talk about the death of Mary. The principal concern for a theology of death are to relate, and here I'm going with Father Karl Rahner and his uh, towards uh, theology of death. He says the principal concern for a theology of death is to relate death as a universal human phenomena to the mystery of sin on the one hand and to the redemptive mystery of the death of Jesus on the other. The handbook definition of death as the separation of soul and body, while correct, says too little for a theologian. And likewise, although there is a connection between sin and death, it is far from adequate to see death merely as a punishment for sin. Death for human beings is not something that happens to persons from outside, Rahner says. It is a distinctively human act related to the peculiar nature of human existence. As the final moment of a free personal history, death is seen as a decisive act of human freedom in which a person can either accept or reject the mystery of God and thereby put the final seal on his or her personal history and destiny. If we could endlessly revise who we are, if we could reinvent ourselves for all eternity, there would be no real self there. We would be free to be everything but our real self. And so if we can't define ourselves definitively at the point of death, there would be no real freedom. Karl Rahner argued that it is not the mere fact of death that is caused by sin, but the present way in which we experience death as a mystery of darkness and threat. If sin distorts and darkens all our experience in life, it is consistent that, uh, that it darkens and distorts our final experience in death. For both Rahner and the, and the Holy Father, the free act by which we give ourselves over into the hands of God's love and mercy is the central mystery of the theology of death. It is the way believers enter into the dying of Christ. Seen in this way, the basic mystery of death is already anticipated throughout life in the little dying by which we give ourselves over to God in charity. Jesus dies on the cross saying, Abba, and he dies saying, forgive them. This is the seal of his freedom, and it is done in solidarity with us in great pain. His human and this is the way we over he overcomes evil. His humanity is perfected or transformed so that it becomes the apt instrument to communicate divinity in the mode in which it was handed over. His humanity was perfected as high priest and as intercessor. He dies as priest, and so he's raised up as priest. As with Jesus, so with Mary. Did Mary, in fact, die? There is uncertainty about her physical death. Um, and, the, and the Catholic Church, as I understand it, uh, it hasn't come up definitively to say she either did or did not physically die. But if death is on the level of both nature and person and involves a definitive exercise of freedom, Mary would have died spiritually before she died physically. Where did this happen? She handed herself first over to the Father in her fiat spoken to Gabriel. That fiat bore fruit in Bethlehem. She gave birth to the Savior. As I said, the tradition teaches that this birth was painless since birth pangs are among the penalties that accompany those touched by original sin. But the tradition also says that she became a mother again on Calvary and there underwent birth pangs. She had to surrender to the Father and his plan for his son's sacrificial death on the cross. 
And this surrender also involved accepting the beloved disciple as her son. John and Mary are at the foot of the cross. Seeing that all things were accomplished, Jesus uh, saw the disciple and said, Son, behold your mother. And looking at his mother, he said, Woman, behold your son. That was, had to be a renunciation and a terrible loss for Mary. A cons consolation, of course, but also a great loss because it underscores the loss of the presence of her true son, Jesus himself. John, however great a disciple he is, could never replace him. But she was called on to accept this according to the wisdom of the Father and accept this she did. But, in a way, it killed her. As Jesus died in an act of priestly intercession, so he was raised up in the act of priestly intercession. As we die, so are we raised up as well. And the parallel with Mary is clear. In accepting John, she was required to die to self in the act of giving birth to the beloved disciple who is representative of all disciples. And that's how she's raised up. Christ mediates divine life to us specifically as a priest. Mary also mediates divine life to us in her own proper way because she's our mother. She mediates the grace maternally. She mediates grace by giving birth to us as disciples. That's her mediation as our mother. She does so in total dependence upon her son, but she does so truly. She is called the mother of God and can well be called uh, the mother of all grace. So that's what I basically wanted to communicate tonight, that Mary is, uh, overcomes the mystery of evil in her own fiat, and by giving birth to us as uh, her children, she allows us to share by participation in that grace. Her yes to God, her son's yes to the Father, can become our yes as well. She can mediate that to us if we trust her as our mother. Okay. Well... Thank you very much, Father Corbett. That was uh, a delightful presentation. We have actually a lot of questions uh, coming to us through uh, the various chat platforms from Zoom and YouTube. Uh, so our first question tonight comes from Morgan Whitmer, and Morgan asks this uh, through YouTube. Father, can you explain further how Mary's preservation from sin is different from Adam and Eve's prelapsarian state? So Adam and Eve before the fall versus Mary's preservation from sin. I think it's uh, I think it, it has to do with destiny. Final causes are real causes. So I think that uh, it's part of a decree of predestination. The Father sees her, and she, he knows what she is for. She's created uh, uh, for this specific kind of openness as mother of uh, the second mother of the human race. So I think that and Adam and Eve were not created for that purpose. So I, th I think that the final destiny of Adam and Eve as the, the first Adam and Eve is different from the destiny of the second one and the, uh, the grace is shaped to a destiny. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so we have another question. This is from um, this is perhaps a more difficult question for you, Father. Uh, this is from Patricia coming through Zoom. Father Corbett, did I misinterpret your statement that St. Thomas Aquinas did not accept Mary's Immaculate Conception? Is that correct? I think and if so. so. How did St. Thomas become a saint? Would he, would he not rather be considered a heretic? No, he'd rather be considered a saint. St. Thomas says that St. Thomas never says that a mere theological error qualifies you as a heretic. You have to do more than that. You have to earn it. You have to willfully persist in a teaching that the church has condemned. So uh, uh, there's an obstinacy 
in, involved in heresy, which would, is never involved in a mere material the theological error. Great. Well, we have a few more questions here. Um, Kathy, uh, coming to us through Zoom, asks this. Uh, Father, you've mentioned the fall a lot. Uh, would you claim that this took place literally as we read it in Genesis 1 or 2? Uh, was it allegorical? Was there some other account for it? And if it's allegorical, then can you uh, explain how we inherit the effects of original sin? Well, uh, I think the, the, the account here is, um, I don't think it's literal, but I don't think it's allegorical either. An allegory stands for something, you see, uh, of which you already have a good idea. You know, the flower represents purity, the, the water brook resents, uh, represents the chaos in life, and so on and so forth. An allegory is kind of a one-for-one uh, representation of something that we already understand. Here we're in waters that we frankly don't understand. Now, we do know this, that there, however remotely in the past is, uh, humanoid creatures for, first at some point became capable of thought and capable of choice. Until that time they were in a sphere of protected innocence where they could not sin. But somewhere in the, along the line, uh, a, a rational soul was infused and that was, uh, it enabled them to recognize a fundamental choice for, for what it was good and a, fundamental, a possibility of a fundamental choice rejecting that. Uh, and the, the, the loss of innocence happened there. What did that look like historically? Where did it happen? Were they articulate? I don't know. I don't know, but I think that there is, there is a, a, a single origin for the human race, and it did involve the gift of intelligence and freedom and the abuse of those gifts. I would say that, but I wouldn't be able to tell you when, where, how, what it looked like, or uh, whether it conformed at literally to the pattern shown us in Genesis. I think the pattern uh, is closer something to myth. I don't know that, I mean, what's, was there, for example, a real paradise? Was there ever a real state where they were free from death? I hesitate to answer that. I don't know. Uh, I'm inclined to doubt it, but I yield to dogmatic theologians who are better versed in this than I am. For example, Father Legg might be able to be uh, uh, more usefully uh, consulted on that topic. Uh, well, I don't know if that's true, but I can ask you, I can ask you another question. You're on the hot seat tonight. So, all right, um, all right. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you uh, continue to uh, field them. Um, uh, another question here, this is also, again, from uh, Morgan coming to us through YouTube. Did the Blessed Virgin Mary suffer temptation in the same way that we do? And how can you account for that? Um, I do not... Well, our Lord himself experienced temptation. The... the uh, the Gospels tell us that he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. So if he did, I'm sure she must have been as well. But um, on the, there's a difficult, there's a theological difficulty in affirming that the Lord was tempted, and that because that would mean uh, an evil possibility had some positive allure for him, which would mean that his appetites were disordered in some way. So, uh, so, I, so he couldn't have been tempted in the way that I am. I look at something evil, and I say, "Oh my, that's attractive," you know, because I'm partly bent. Or if you give someone, get someone there who's not bent, who's totally of a piece, then it's harder to be tempted in that way. That do, that doesn't mean that um, they're not under trial. It just means that it's, their trial doesn't come from distorted appetites. Now, what is that like? I don't know. I'll wait till I have undistorted appetites, and then I'll be able to tell you. But I don't think that Mary would have been tempted to, say, petty jealousy, for example. Why is Elizabeth getting all the attention? It's my turn. No, I don't think that that would have crossed her mind ever. Well, let me ask a kind of a follow-up on this, and it's related to what you said uh, about the concentration camp guard. Yeah. So you made the uh, you made you gave an example to a, a concentration camp guard who 
uh, is still, you know, goes home and plays with his children and uh, listens to music, uh, maybe even makes music. He's nice to his neighbors. He's, uh, he might be very polite. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, he's engaged in these, in these awful acts. And there's perhaps a part of him that has started to distance himself from the evil that he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, can you, uh, well, speak for a moment about the, the different way that, uh, well, how grace integrates the person, and which we would see in the Blessed Virgin Mary, versus what happens in us with sin and that kind of disintegration? Well, um, I would say, starting with us, I would say uh, that uh, this is why in the discussions of the spiritual life, you always begin, and you're talking about general stages of the spiritual life, you always begin with the purgative. Uh, because what happens in, with holiness, what happens is that you really start to come together. This can be, th this is by no means always pleasant. Uh, it, because you see all of the, the creatures that you've got hidden in your basement start coming up into your living room and start ordering drinks. You know, you, th you thought you'd suppress them or gotten rid of them, and here they are appearing. You know, uh, Jung called it the shadow side. It, so uh, when you try to become holy, uh, life becomes suddenly very difficult and you become aware of all kinds of infirmities. This is not... Uh, an evil thing, this is a good thing. It's your disorder is coming forward into light to be healed. Now, this wouldn't have happened in the same way with Mary, but I think that she would have simply grown. Her capacities would have expanded and she would have grown in love for God and also grown, grown in a healthy or a, a life-giving sorrow for the sins of the world. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, and that the, the mourning there has to do with those who mourn for the sad state of God's people. God did not want this for this people. He wants them to mirror his own holiness. She would have seen the unholiness around her, and it would have caused her grief, but not distortion. We are distorted by our grief, and she's able to take it straight. You know, and that involves... Uh, enduring sin, but not taking it personally. Enduring sin, but not being dis di disfigured by its scars. Uh, enduring evil, but not becoming bitter. Her patience at the cross would show that, you know. In the face of obscenity, the human race killing God's own son and her own beloved child, and the, she's not hysterical. She is. Uh, She's serene. You know, she's able to look at this with acceptance and compassion. How does she do that? that there's a grace there beyond my ken. Marvelous. Well, uh, let me ask one. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and this comes from Anne through Zoom. But I'm going to add uh, to Anne's question and kind of combine it with one of my own. So this is her question. Isn't pain, any pain, including childbirth and death, uh, just a part of being human? insofar as we all have nerve endings and so forth. Even Jesus died and felt both physical and emotional pain, so why not Mary? And so that's Anne's question. Let me uh, just add to that. I once uh, gave a homily um, on the, uh, the miraculous birth of Christ. So that is at Christmas that Jesus uh, is born without Mary uh, experiencing labor pains, for example, as you mentioned. Um, and one uh, person in the, in the congregation was actually really offended by this oh, yeah, idea. Yeah, absolutely. Because thought uh, it sort of denigrated, it denigrated the, the denigrated women the, or uh, denigrated everybody else. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So could you speak about, about that? Well, uh, I, I didn't, I remember I said that, uh, about Mary um, that she wasn't born. Uh, her privilege of being immaculately conceived did not exempt her from tiredness, nerve endings, uh, upset, uh, strain. And she would have undergone all those things, but she would have undergone them with integration and a, and a, and a grace or a, an inner peace that we would be missing. But the, those conditions would still be there. Um, what was the part? Uh, and then, well, isn't isn't uh, pain simply a part of the human condition? It is, but it's not, thank God, a final part of the human condition. That is to say, it, 
It exists now and it serves even on a biological level, a function that or, or alerts us to danger or injury. So uh, yes, that's all true, but um, it's not a definitive state. Here's where Christian eschatology comes into play. Uh, our pains are destined to be overcome, that, they, that they're not the final word. The, death, the pain that is a presager of death and the death that we die is not the final word. We're destined or put on track to a glorious body, you know, resurrection, which transcends present limitation. Now that's faith language, and I could not really describe what's that like. And the best I could do now is just be being comfortable after a long day. You know, uh, it's inadequate. I said that our imaginations are unable to cope with the singleness of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The same way our imagination aren't really capable of conceiving of a post-pain state that is not being numb. You know or intoxicated with excitement. Somehow it's n none of those things, and yet it's the fulfillment of every dream. We won't know what it's like until we see it. 